Holy Spirit into us so that I may speak the truth and that the truth may be heard. And we thank you for all the wonderful words that you've given us. And thank you for the ability for us to speak directly to you, to pray directly to you. We pray this through our high priest in heaven, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so the title of the sermon is How I'm Learning to Pray. And the reason I use learning is because, of course, I'm still learning. This is an ongoing process, uh, and I still have a lot to learn. I certainly have learned a lot in the last six years since I started coming to this church, uh, through the people here in the church, and, of course, through my... <laughs> through, <laughs> through, through my wife, Sally. Thank you so much. <clears throat> So prayer is an ongoing process, it, just like sanctification and justification. You have to work at it daily. You have to do it daily. And so that's one of the things, of course, I've learned. And we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. I started praying when I was a small child. You know, uh, when I was a little kid, my dad used to bring me upstairs and tuck me in. And we used to kneel at my bed and uh, we'd say the Lord's Prayer together. And then I'd say that childhood prayer that I'm sure you all heard. Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Well, you know, as a small child, this is kind of a scary prayer to say, but it, but, you know, it, it also was kind of reassuring to me that, uh, you know, that the Lord was going to take care of me if I did die. My parents also made me pray at dinner time, and I started as a young child. And uh, I would pray the very short Lutheran prayer that I had memorized at the time. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts taught to be blessed. Of course, you know, I, I'd say it faster and faster because, you know, I was looking at the food going, wow, like, you know, these, this mom, this food looks really good. You know, in fact, I didn't realize it was Jesus that was bringing this food to us. It was a gift of our Lord. So... You know, of course, I wasn't really thinking when I was praying. And this is what Jesus was talking about in the verses that Sally read in Matthew 6, 7. He said, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think they have been heard by their many words. That's what we should not be doing is repetition. So what is prayer? Well, I read a lot in the last couple of weeks about it since I'm doing this talk this sermon and this is a great one that I heard the heart of a prayer is to experience God's presence in our life the heart of a prayer is to experience God's presence in our lives <clears throat> in other words the more we pray the more we are connected with God and we bring God to us but Ellen G. White had something interesting to say about prayer. She says, prayer does not bring God down to us. It brings us up to God, right? So through prayer, we get to know and experience God's grace. Prayer is not just spewing out a memorized bunch of words. And also, we cannot go to God with our wish list and expect Him to spew out like a cosmic vending machine what we want. That's not true at all. In James, this is James chapter 4, verse 3, James writes, You should ask, and you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. You know, the... Um, Pastor, many times in the past, has said we should pray for what we need, not, the, not the what we want. Pray for what you need, not what you want. If it fits God's will or his plans, he will grant our request, but of course, on his time, right? So, last week the pastor was talking about that God already knows what we need, even before we ask. And Jesus tells the same thing in Matthew chapter 6. Verse 8, I hope. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of, even before you ask. So remember, of course, when Jesus was playing in the garden, praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, not Yosemite, uh, Gethsemane, 
He said, not my will, but your will be done. And that's the way we need to think about it. Prayer is an important part of worship. And, and it is our way to give praise to the God. To God is the way I give thanks to the Lord. And ask who to ask for forgiveness, right? <clears throat> Many of the great prayers in the Bible start with these incredible praises to the Lord. And this is something that we should do when we pray. God does not need to be reminded how great he is. You remember, his thoughts are greater than ours. But it's our way of reminding ourselves of the great privilege we have of talking directly to God, our creator, ruler of the universe. You know, we can't talk to Biden that way, can we? So, let's see, page two, it's in here somewhere. In the Bible, people prayed directly to God. It doesn't have to go through a priest, except, of course, our high priest in heaven, or to the mother of the human Jesus. Remember, she's dead, and she's in her grave. And as you know, the dead know nothing, right? Because uh, the purpose of prayer is to have an intimate connection with God. We pray to have a connection with God. And God wants us to have this intimate connection with his believers and, of course, even his non-believers. God is trying to call everybody to him. In the Bible, of course, prayer has changed history. You know, we have talked about Jonah and the great fish. Of course, after his prayer from the stomach of the fish and he was thrown up on the beach, sorry the pun, um, he was put back on his mission uh, to go warn Nineveh. And so Jonah went to Nineveh and delivered God's warning that they would be destroyed in 40 days. Well, the people of Nineveh heard Jonah's warning. And so what they did is they put on sackcloth and prayed. And even the king made a decree that everyone should stop working, stop eating, put on their sackcloth and pray. Well, great, God saw their good works and of repentance. They were repenting and repenting and changed his mind about destroying the city. And this, of course, made Jonah angry. And there's a really good verse. Jonah chapter 4, verse 4. And this is what God says. This is, Jonah wants God to kill him. And, and God answers this. Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? This is a question we need to ask ourselves. Too. Do we have any right to be angry? Of course not. You know, we need to ask this as our Christian selves. Remember the people in the Dark Ages. Uh, you know, they suffered a lot. Christians have been suffering a lot for the past 2,000 years. And they still are, as a matter of fact. And a lot of them accept it. You know, whether it's God's will or not, I don't know. But I, I would call it more that they are caught in the crossfire of the great controversy, right? In the book of Daniel, Daniel makes two great prayers. Of course, the one I'm talking about is in chapter 9. In the beginning of the prayer, he has this incredible praise of God. This is chapter 9, verse 4. O oh Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps, his who's co who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. So all we need to do is love God and try to keep his commandments. And then he goes on and asks, of course, for, for forgiveness. And this is in the next line. And he says, We have sinned and committed inequity and have done wickedly and rebelled even di by departing from your precepts and your judgments. So why did this change history? God heard his prayers and he sent the angel to help Daniel explain the prophecies. These are prophecies that we believe as Adventists. The 70 week prophecy, the 1260 day prophecy, the 2800 day prophecy. These are words that Daniel finally understood. <clears throat> Another prayer that starts history also started with great praises to the Lord. And this is Jehoshaphat's prayer. And this is in Second Chronicles chapter 20. Of course, let me set up the situation for you. 
the kingdoms around Judah, around Jerusalem, decided that they wanted to destroy Jerusalem. So they all got together and they were going to come marching in and destroy Jerusalem and Judah. But, and Jehoshaphat figured out, hey, there's no way we can defend ourselves against this massive amount of people. So in verse 12 of uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, Jehoshaphat prays this, O our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against the great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. This is a good lesson. We have to realize that we are powerless and we need to ask God for our help to give us a direction. And this is an important point to remember that we are powerless. Jonah knew it when he was in the belly of the fish. I mean, he didn't have any choice except to become fish food, right? So all he could do is ask for, ask for God's help. And that's what he did until he was thrown up on the beach. Another beautiful prayer is in Moses, uh, in Exodus. Moses prays his prayer in chapter 33. And just to remind you what happens in chapter 32 at the beginning, Moses is up on Mount Sinai talking with God and getting the Ten Commandments. Meanwhile, the Israelites are down there having a party, and they made the golden calf. Of course, Moses comes back down from the mountain with carrying the Ten Commandments and sees what's going on, and he smashes the Ten Commandments. Of course, after a few days, he realizes he has to go back up to God and ask for atonement, ask for forgiveness for the Israelis. Of course, God answered him, and this is an interesting thing that God says, those who have sinned against me will I blot out of my book. So, you know, we have to be careful what we do, but we need to ask for forgiveness, and that's what Moses does. Moses prays a very short prayer, and this is in Exodus 33, verse 13. And it says, Now therefore I pray, I have found grace in your sight. Show me your Show me now your way, that I may know you, and I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. Show me your way. That's a good prayer for all of us to pray. And of course, God answered him. This is in verse 14. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Wouldn't that be wonderful to hear from God? I will give you rest. All right, I have to find my next page here. Oh, you know, I, I was talking about prayer in the Bible. Of course, I wanted to talk a little bit about Jesus, but I realized that's a whole other sermon in itself. Christ has so many great prayers in the Gospels. But I do want to mention one thing. We're talking about praise of the Lord. Of course, the most famous prayer, our Lord's Prayer, starts off with great praise in the first 20 words or so. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Beautiful praise. I wanted to talk about another thing that um, uh, Jesus said. And this is in chapter 24 of Matthew. As you, re as you know, this is where Jesus gives a lot of his um, prophecies. But this is an interesting prayer or prophecy. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place. And then he says this in parentheses, and I'm curious as why this is in parentheses. Whoever reads, let him understand. I think that's actually a prayer, and it's a prayer for us. We need to understand Daniel's prophecies. That's an important part of our beliefs. You know, the fact that he's talking about the abomination of desolation, that to me indicates that Jesus is an historicist. He believed in the present day. He believed in Daniel's prophecies that are happening. And as Adventists believe, we believe in the, in the, in the prophecies of Daniel. We believe in the 1260-day prophecy. We believe in the 70-week prophecy. So many people put that 70-week prophecy and tack it way at the end and call it the seven years of tribulation. That's wrong. You know, the Reformers who founded Protestantism, which we are part of, they were all historicists. They believe in, in what Daniel was saying. And for some reason, some of the denominations of Christianity have gotten astray from that and put this 70-week prophecy way in, the, way in the future, the abomination of desolation. They put that back 
200 years before Jesus when the Seleucid general invaded Jerusalem. I think there might be a good reason for that. All right. In the New Testament, Paul gives the Thessalonians, the Thessalonians, say that real fast 20 times, instruction on prayer. Paul sent, Paul spent much of his time praying, and he felt that prayer was an important part of worship. In the first letter to the Thessalonians, this is chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. This is beautiful. This is great instruction for us. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for it is the will of God in Christ Jesus and for you. Okay? That's important. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. So, <clears throat> this is my Sabbath school pitch. Uh, in Sabbath school, we're, of course, this quarter we're studying Ephesians. Uh, last quarter we were studying the three angels' messages. It's very, very informative. I have learned so much from going to Sabbath school. I started here six years ago. Um, but I wanted to read Sunday's lesson, which is tomorrow's lesson. And this uh, is up here. Try to read along with me because I have a tendency to mumble sometimes. What does it really mean, mean to pray without ceasing? It cannot mean that we are always on, kneeling on our knees before God in prayer. It does mean that, blessed by God's Spirit, we move through life with hearts open to the presence and power of God, seeking cues for thanksgiving to Him. It means a readiness to process the issues of life in the presence of God and to seek divine counsel as we experience the twists and turns that life brings. It means living not in estrangement from God, but with engagement with Him, ever open to divine leading. And as I said before earlier, God wants to connect with His children. <clears throat> and the best way for us to do it is through prayer. And then the last paragraph of this lesson is, we too often view prayer as a nicety, an add-on to discipleship that is to be exercised when convenient. Paul illustrates a different view. Paul takes seriously the task of praying for the believers in Ephesus, doing so both by giving thanks for them and by interceding for them. For him, prayer is a central, even the central task of Christian faith. It is the central task of Christian faith. These verses provide a moving call for prayer, an invitation for each of us to consider his own prayer ministry in the light of Paul's dedication to it. So, you know, you can get this quarterly. You can download it on your, on your phone with Sabbath School Quarterly, and you can read the lesson. You don't have to have the book, and you can sit in the back. It, many people do this. They sit in the back. They don't really participate in the discussion. They don't have to, but it's a good way to learn. That's why I started out, and then I got more and more involved in Sabbath School, and now I'm teaching. And, and we have great teachers, Tom and Cheryl and Sally, and of course I teach too. So um, <clears throat> it's something to, to do. It's something to, that would really help you learn more about the Scripture and get you closer to God. Uh, you know, now this is the last paragraph. Of course, the title of my sermon is How I'm Learning to Pray. And of course, as I said, I'm still learning. I've learned a lot of things in the past six years, mostly through praying in Sabbath school, praying with uh, people in the church and particularly with Sally, my wife. <clears throat> you know, since I'm the husband of the household, uh, I should be the one that leads the prayers in the household. And so almost every day, Sally and I get on our knees and pray together. And we pray about our lives, about our families. We pray about this church. And of course, we pray about our patients. And many times throughout the day, I found myself, when I'm in clinic, asking for God's help to better communicate what I'm trying to tell people to do and ask that they understand what I'm saying, which is a hard thing to do. And also when I'm in surgery, many times in there, looking through the microscope, asking for God's help. And you know what? A lot of times God grants me his help as far as prayer. We are helpless without him, right? So... So now I'm speaking to the husbands and dads in the audience. Teach your family to pray. Get together every day and pray. And a good place to start is at dinner. 
sit down to dinner and pray with your family. It's good that they're all together anyway and have dinner together. It makes the family stronger. Prayer makes the family stronger. It brings us closer to God. Teach your children to pray. Our children should be taught to pray in this church. It's a way for all of us to connect with God rather than connecting with the world that we're in. That's it. Amen. Oh, thank you. All right, you going to sing? Oh, yes. We're going to sing. Um, this is a well-known hymn. It's a Lutheran's hymn, A Mighty Fortress. Uh, Lutheran wrote this hymn nearly 500 years ago. Now, he wrote it in German, of course, and it was translated to English about 200 years ago. And this, of course, uh, the language is a little funny, but look at the words. Tom told me that I remember the first time we sang this. Look at the words and read the words and hear what they're saying. Sorry, Gary. <laughs> Doctor, if we waited for Adventists to fill the hymn book, we'd be in a long wait, wouldn't we? It's good that God's message can start somewhere and find its way here. Let's stand and do all four verses of A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Truer words were never spoken. Dress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. Our Father, our Father in heaven. We're so thankful for all the wonderful blessings you've given us, all these gifts. They're so numerous, we can't even know them all. Amen. And we ask that you guide us this week. As, as Moses prayed, show us your way. Amen. And we ask that you give us peace and show us and be in our presence. We pray this through our Lord in heaven, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>